So our next uh, speaker is uh, Martin Miller from uh, Frankfurt, who's going to speak on uh, Gothic modular form. Thanks for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to tell you about Gothic art. And uh, let, this is all, well, the Gothic art is all joint work with David Torres from Saarbrücken. And let me give you one minute. Uh, no, Goethe was not involved in Gothic art. <laughs> I mean, although there are some letters in common, but he's not involved in Gothic art. He's not a so, so, no, no. So let me give you some motivation. So, um, so this is for the French. Maybe you know this early example of Gothic art. This is the floor plan of Notre Dame. Notre Dame in Paris, uh, Paris of course. <laughs> and uh, since we're in the UK here, I also have uh, my tribute to the UK. So this is the floor plan of a later example of Gothic art. No. no. Is it Westminster? This is Westminster. I have all credits in Seoul. A contemporary example of Gothic art. And this is the floor plan of... <laughs> is this McMullen? Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it's really great. Um, so, so this is what I'm actually uh, be talking about um, in, the, in the next hour. So I want there is um, the Gothic locus, which I'm going to define right uh, on the next slide. And there's a bunch of type more curves. So I'm I want to come back to type more curves, the geometry of the, the type more curves in this locus, and there are a bunch of things that um, will. Um, it's similar to what has happened in the other series of low genus type molar curves. And there are some new <coughs> phenomena that I want to tell you about. So, so this is a mouthful after that recreation of the beginning. So let's see what the Gothic locus is. The Gothic locus is a set of translation surfaces in genus 4, M4, the moduli space of genus 4 surfaces. Um, it comes with a um, holomorphic one form that has three double zeros and along with it you can define um, three mark points you can you can forget about them but it's convenient to have them from the very beginning in the picture three mark points zeros of order zero so the three double zeros are called zi i from one to three and the mark points are called pi and um, that comes with a bunch of extra conditions namely first of all there is an evolution which is called J. So if, I, if my surface is X, there is an evolution J that acts on the surface X. And if I take, I can take the quotient mod, um, J, I end up with the surface um, A with G, uh, the genus of A B1. This is an elliptic curve. Um, and um, one condition or two conditions um, are that um, the form omega is an eigenform for the action um, of J, and it's in the minus one eigenspace. So you could phrase it differently. Omega squared is a pullback of a quadratic differential that lives down here on that curve. And the zeros and the mark points are just um, the fixed points of that evolution, J. And there is a second map to an elliptic curve that I want to call B, <coughs> J of B. And whereas this one, this is, um, is a Galois cover, a Galois automorphism being given by J, this one is, for a typical surface, not Galois. So this is not Galois, not Galois in, in general. And this map is 2 to 1. After all, this is the quotient map by evolution. And that map is to be. 3 to 1. And uh, there are a few more conditions that are not that important. I mean, the, I'm reading the last one. There's an elliptic involution, a J elliptic down here for any elliptic curve with respect to this appropriately chosen base point. And the map is odd, so um, there is a uh, compatibility between applying J um, up here and going down in, in the elliptic involution first, which is the last symbols of that thing. But one thing is, um, which is important is that um, the, the three zeros of the holomorphic one form go to a single single point here. Pi is just a it's 
just a holomorphic map? It's, it's a holomorphic map. It's a holomorphic. Um, more, all these are holomorphic. I mean, I'm a complex geometer. So everything is here on the blackboard is holomorphic maps between whatever kind of objects, unless stated otherwise. I'm not. But it's not flat. It doesn't preserve the transition. It does not. There is the, 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 the omega is a pullback of the quadratic differential here, but there is no differential here um, that you could pull back to give. Uh, okay. Um, this is the Gothic locus, and let me remind you um, some of the, the facts and the reason why Mukamel, um, McMullen, and Wright introduced the uh, locus. It's, um, it's a closed irreducible variety um, of dimension 4, locally defined by real linear equation in period coordinates. So it's one of those um, exceptional SL2R invariant manifolds, and that's why it's interesting to type all the dynamics. And um, it has a it has a has a friend, a funny friend, in the, in the modelized space of genus one surfaces where you retain three mark points, which happens to be a totally geodesic surface, a totally geodesic uh, complex to uh, two-dimensional object. That won't be important in that thing, but it was one of their um, additional striking um, findings along with that Gothic locus. What will be important um, is that um, the Gothic locus is like the uh, minimal stratum in genus 2. Like the minimal stratum means I'm repeating a um, bunch of obvious conditions. It has complex dimension 4, just to count. It has rank 2. It's a rank 2 manifold in the sense that um, the uh, dimension of the tangent space to that manifold in absolute period coordinates is 2 times 2. Rank is half the dimension of the tangent space to the manifold in absolute period coordinates. And like um, the minimal stratum in genus 2, um, the Gothic locus has rank 2. And it's defined um, by Q linear equations um, that I might be showing you on a later slide for the moment. Just the stratum is defined over Q or the Gothic locus is defined over Q? Well, both are. But, I mean, for the stratum, that's, um, that, that's not much of a condition because it means um, it's defined in the whole space by being the, the, the point being a double zero. Wow. Well, the, well, your previous slide, you said it was half mark. So the previous slide? Uh, well, that's, that's the usual def, um, um, terminology um, confusion, whether you want them um, to be call them affine manifolds or linear manifolds. They're cut out by linear equations. But there's the question if you... A little bit the defining field on the previous slide. Oh, the, the defining field is Q. And on the previous slide, it, it said nothing about the defining field. Oh, sorry. I, I, there, there shouldn't be any contradiction. It's defined over Q. Um, so in all, for all practical purposes, it's like the stratum, the principal stratum genus 2. And for, for those who know, it's also like the prim eigenform loci in genus 3 and 4. But there is a numerical um, invariance that behave differently, and that's something that has puzzled us for quite a while. That's a, what I'm going to be talking So I don't want to analyze the Gothic locus in total. I want to analyze the, the Teichmuller curves um, in that um, Gothic locus. And for a, a manifold uh, with the conditions as in the previous slide, um, dimension uh, 4, rank 2, um, defined over Q. There's a canonic procedure to find an infinite collection of Teichmuller curves. Namely, um, you will look at the subset of um, um, those curves where we have uh, real multiplication on the um, on the prim part. So let me let me put um, some explanation for that here. So if if I take a specific fiber and look at the cohomology. Um, of that specific fiber, of course, what, um, there are several pieces that uh, make up that cohomology. You have um, the cohomology of the first elliptic curve. So this is, uh, this is rank 2 times 4. This is the cohomology of an elliptic curve, so this is rank 2. There's the cohomology of the 
second um, elliptic curve, which is also rank 2. Um, and, well, I, sh I should pull them back uh, using these maps, but I, I'm neglecting that. And that uh, sits in there basically as a, as a direct sum of that. And the whole thing is that thing plus some, some rest. And the rest is what I call the prim part of uh, the cohort. Um, so um, being in, um, so the, the holomorphic one form, the real and imaginary part of the holomorphic one form that is defining the locus, are part of that prim uh, part of cohomology. So if I say I want the prim eigen, um, the Gothic eigenform locus, I want that this part of cohomology um, carries the action um, of OD, an order um, inside um, some quadratic field here joint square root of D for some positive D. That's what it means to me to be real multiplication. Um, and it's a pretty standard procedure that we have um, seen in genus 2 and in the pr prim cases that those loci of eigenforms under the condition before are um, union of Teichmuller curves. So what are these Teichmuller curves? How do the, those Teichmuller curves look like? Um, one further remark that makes the construction here interesting is that these are the primitive Teichmuller curves. They don't arise from covering constructions. If D is not a square, if D is a square, they're just orthogonals. And um, so what I want to do is I want to run the same program that has successfully been run for genus two and the prim um, eigenform loci by. Let me make. Malm, Bainbridge, Mukamel, Landon, Bien, Zahuba, Torres, uh, Thomas, I don't know. The union of these people gives uh, that we currently know sort of everything on the geometry of the prim and genus 2 type walkers. And here um, I'm, we're about to explore all that story. Meaning, first of all, we want to define the, well, roughly the genus, correct, more correctly, the orbifold or the characteristic of those Gothic Teichmuller curves. And that's something, well, a few days we have it. Um, we all have it, as I'll tell you by the end of the um, talk. Um, the same strategy gives also an access to uh, understanding the cusps of the, those Teichmuller curves, and gives a strategy to understand the cusp of the Teichmuller curves without drawing any flat pictures. Um, and it gives you a glimpse towards the components, which will appear in a few slides. I'm not saying that I can classify the components. And in fact, a good classification of components of these type more curves um, is also something that I consider a challenge for the other loci, genus 2 and prim loci. Good meaning without tedious um, butterfly moves for those. Okay, that's, that's the goal of what I want to talk about. So question, um, who was the first to write down a Gothic Teichmuller curve? Didn't I say um, Mukamel, uh, McMullen, right, invented them? Yes and no. Um, the first uh, person to write down a Gothic Teichmuller curve was Clayton Ward in 1990. And uh, here's the Gothic duck. <laughs> Um, because it looks more like a duck than a cathedral. Um, and um, you might, uh, more drive to earth terms, call it a semi-regular hexagon. It um, it's consists of, in fact, three hexagons glued um, by the opposite pattern. And if you want the, the precise um, side length and measurements, you could read the, the small things that I visibly wrote um, down there. Um, if you look at that picture, um, you'll, you will find that picture if you open um, um, for, for, for a very concrete set of parameters x and y. Um, if you open Pat Cooper's paper on grid surfaces, and uh, 
italics, right? That's basically also a version of that thing. So, next slide should tell me that um, for, um, for the two parameters x and y that were the thing was depending on, that uh, surface appears um, um, as a drawing um, of Hoopers and, and writes of a class of type mode curves that have been known before. And in particular, they appear in the, those series of triangle um, type more curves, meaning in that case, we know, um, or it has been uh, known since 1990, um, that um, the Veach group of that type more curve is this 3, 6 infinity triangle group, and in particular, the orbifold model characteristic is known to be net minus a half. And moreover, um, on the previous slide, you know all the periods, you know all the side length, they're explicitly given to you. So you can compute um, what happens in the cohomology, you can compute um, uh, what um, discriminant you have real multiplication by, and it turns out that, you have, um, that this is the case for discriminant 12, as I wrote on the next slide. So um, to put that in, in context, um, how do I, why do I claim that this Gothic duck is Gothic at all? It doesn't look like a cathedral, does it? Um, so let me briefly, last um, step that I recall from Hukamel, right, is how to, um, how to see that. Suppose, suppose you move that little white dot a li little bit to the interior so that it exactly sits on that line. Suppose you move that little gray dot a little bit to the interior so that it's, it sits exactly on the straight line between the black dot and um, the white dot, and suppose you turn for convenience, um, the picture a little bit. You arrive oops, at a bunch of regular hex the hexagons, which appear all also in, in the paper I'm, I'm quoting all the time. So the regular hexagon has an obvious um, automorphism of order 6. I guess everybody sees that. So the third power of this automorphism of order 6 is the J that gives the quotient down here. And um, for the regular hexagon, um, the second power of that thing of order 6 makes that accidentally that map to be Gaul. So um, the regular hexagon fits in that picture. It's, it's by definition um, something, it's, it's Gothic by definition. And now you have to check um, what, uh, what you can, um, how you can form the vertices um, in order to maintain all those conditions of uh, required to be in the Gothic locus. And there's two ways you can do. You can find two sets of cylinder decomposition. You can go back and take that cylinder decomposition and deform and you eventually arrive at the Gothic duck. Or you could go forward and take um, that cylinder decomposition that are, uh, appears in the original paper and do a bunch of uh, shearings, cut and re-glue, and arrive at a cathedral. That's just a summary that cathedrals and ducks are roughly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what are we actually doing in order to move forward and, and, and do math and compute all the characteristics? Um, I have defined to you the, the Gothic locus. I mean, the, the Gothic time model curves had an omega in front, which meant that I kept the differential. And if I forget about the differential form, if I quotient by the rescaling, I land with, by, um, at an object that sits in the moduli space of genus four surfaces. Um, from that moduli space, from the surface, um, moduli space of genus four surfaces, I can go to the abelian variety. So I go, can go to the Jacobian of that uh, genus four surface, but um, the whole Jacobian is not what I'm interested in. The whole Jacobian is an abelian uh, variety of dimension four. Um, and that, that's sort of too big, for a reason you'll, you'll see soon. So the, the top arrow here is slightly wrong. I shouldn't have drawn it like that. It's not true that on all of the moduli space of genus first surfaces, you can go to, a, you can cut out um, an abelian surface. You can go to a moduli space of abelian surfaces. No. Um, what I meant is um, on part of that um, moduli space, where you have a splitting, where you have two maps to elliptic curves, you can take the, complement, the complementary part in the, in the whole abelian fourfold to that two elliptic curves. You can take the prim part, and that gives you uh, an abelian surface. 
A BN fourfold subtract two dimensions gives you a BN surface over there. Keep in mind that usually the Jacobian of a, of a, of a curve carries a principal polarization. Meaning that, or said differently, the intersection form on the lattice is just the standard intersection form with 1, 1, 1, 1, and uh, minus 1, 1, 1. It's an alternating form. If you restrict that, um, if you take, um, restrict that to a sublattice that sits, it sits inside the side of the beaded surface, it, that, um, intersecting a big lattice in a, in a smaller vector space, there is no reason that the big lattice, um, the intersection form is preserved. Generally, it's not. The intersection form will be of a different type, and in fact, the, the intersection form in that case, well, 2 times 3 is 6. Um, that, um, uh, that's the reason for that 6 that appears here and all over the place. The intersection form on the, um, on the lattice, on the whole lattice, um, intersected with that part um, of the cohomology, um, has um, the, uh, the, the intersection form. Section form is that uh, intersection form here, and this is what it means to be a, a VM, uh, um, surfaces with that non-standard one-six polarization. So what I'm saying is that um, the whole Gothic locus um, has a natural map to the moduli space of a, um, a BN surfaces one-six polarization, and the Teichmuller curves in there um, they map to the <coughs> subset of those BN surfaces. That moreover have the real, uh, real multiplication. So we have both real multiplication and one six polarization. Let's, let's count dimensions in order to see um, the method or what we're doing. Um, this uh, moduli spaces um, of abelian surfaces with real multiplication, they are Hilbert modular surfaces, they are two dimensional. So that object is two dimensional, that object is three dimensional. That object is big dimensional, and you should forget about it. And the Teichmuller curves are, of course, curves. So that thing is two dimensional, one dimension, co dimension one. Here, that, that lower arrow is co dimension one. So the main question is who is cutting out that, those go, Gothic Teichmuller curves um, in the ambient um, Hilbert modular surfaces, loci of real multiplication? And once we have found who's cutting out those things, we're pretty close to understanding um, the author. A slight, um, the slight um, comment on the number of components um, that I want to make is here at that stage. So what is the Hilbert modular surface? Aha, here that, uh, in that audience, I have to be very careful. H2 is two copies of hyperbolic <laughs> of the upper half plane. So for, I think for quite a lot of people in the audience, I should have to write that as h2 squared, right? So just, I'm, but I'm a complex geometer, so for me, h is just the upper half plane. So Hilbert modular surfaces are the upper half plane quotient by something like SL2 of um, OD, but something like, it has to be taken with a grain of salt. So in order to um, get Hilbert modular surfaces that parametrize the of varieties with 1, 6 polarization, the correct thing is usually you would have OD dual plus OD, but no, here it's not OD, it's B. It's some fractional OD ideal of norm 6 for those. Yeah. I have a question with the last slide. The map from the um, Gothic locus to A216, what's mm -hmm. the degree of it? No, no, I already said that this arrow should be there. This, this arrow it shouldn't be there. Yeah, it, it, this arrow is defined only on the sublogs. And the answer to the, to the last thing is it, it's one to one. I know it uh, from various computations that I can give you by the example. I know sort of the, the argument from, from my print paper must go through <coughs> as well. Um, we haven't fully written it yet. I know it from com computational example we can do. But it's part of it. Okay, um, there's, a, there's a certain, uh, for given discriminant, there's a certain number of ideals of norm 6 um, 
namely that many and all the cases that are missing have no ideals um, of norm 6. So you can expect Gothic types, um, type models <coughs> only for those discriminants of um, that are 0, 1, 4, 9, 12, and 16. Um, not 24. For the other ones, you just don't have them. And for, the, uh, for those, um, you definitely have, with exceptions um, in very low discriminant potentially, um, you have at, at least 1, 4, 2, 2, 1, 2 components. I'm not saying that I'm classifying components because still in each of these hill modular surfaces, the thing could be further reducible. This has never appeared so far in the low side. We, we know Prim and, and Genus 2. I have no, well, I have a slight suspicion that it doesn't here appear either based on um, um, testing, probing with Ronan's program that computes each of those. This is a lower bound on the number of components if the whole thing is not empty, which is for me. Okay, so here's the main theorem. It says first attempt, for some reason you'll discover in a moment. So the main theorem is that there is a Hilbert modular form that I call script GD, that's the Gothic Hilbert modular form, um, of weight 1, 3, whose vanishing locus is the Gothic type motor of GD. Of course, the Hilbert modular form lives on, <laughs> is a function on the upper half plane. So the vanishing locus of such a Hilbert modular form, um, so if you divide by the Hilbert modular group, SL of OD check plus B, you arrive at a Hilbert modular surface um, with one six polarization. And the function GD um, is a function um, with the complex numbers on the uniformization of a Hilbert modular surface, but by the transformation law that's explicitly written to you here, the locus, the vanishing locus of a Hilbert modular form um, is a well-defined subset um, of, a Hilbert, um, of that Hilbert modular surface. And if I say the Gothic type model curve um, is that vanishing locus, of course I mean the image of the Gothic um, uh, type model curve in the Hilbert modular surface by the diagram before. So Hilbert modular form, um, the weight of a Hilbert modular form has um, two parameters, one and three. Formally in the definition they appear as the exponent. Here you see a very tiny one, and here you see a three. So that way this means to be a modular form of weight one three, uh, one comma three. So why is that good? Um, so using that uh, theorem, you can compute the Euler characteristic. Namely, um, um, you just integrate over the set, um, um, over the vanishing locus. Um, the Gothic type model curve is the vanishing locus of the Gothic modular form. So you integrate the first eigenform along that um, um, along that vanishing locus. So that equality is basically a translation of the fact that type mode curves are Kobayashi geodesic, that they are always transverse to one of the foliations of the um, uh, Hilbert modular surface, that, the, that the, uh, the canonically associated subsystem moves at full speed. That's what's behind that equality side. And that first step, the left equality, has been, well, it's Matt's uh, Bainbridge's thesis, who has brought up that equality for the first time. And integrating um, um, that integration of modular, the canonical bundle against uh, the vanishing locus of a modular form is standard techniques. The three that appears here in the numerator is the second component of the entry weight. So that three is the same as this three. Uh, and the, 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 what I said is asymmetric because the whole situation is asymmetric because here I'm integrating against the first line. That's the, the usual um, asymmetry of Teichmuller or um, geodesic flow that is a preferred Okay, and um, the volumes of those Hilbert modular surfaces, although they're a bit non-standard, it's straightforward to compute them. So for example, um, for the discriminant 12 we've been for looking at before, the Gothic duct, 
the um, all the characteristic of the Hilbert modular surface is a third. So um, if I compute that thing, the all the characteristic of the Gothic um, Taj Mahal curve is curving at 12 is minus a half. We have seen that minus a half for the T37 for the Gothic duck. Checks out. Let's go home. Well, if you're a physicist, um, no, I didn't want to complain about physics. It's just, uh, it's just, it's just only one example. Um, of, uh, as, you, as you see, I'm making fun of myself because that's the example we were um, stuck at for quite a while. Let's move on with the consequences. The whole thing has consequences. Let's go uh, turn to dynamics for the Lyapunov spectrum. Um, let me um, uh, recap what the Lyapunov spectrum means. So um, whenever um, the Lyapunov exponents for the tight homogeneous flow measure the growth rates of cohomology classes um, when you move along the tight homogeneous flow. So um, that system. Um, we're in genus 4, so uh, the uh, cohomology has rank 8, so I have lambda 1 uh, greater or equal to lambda 2, in fact greater, greater or equal to lambda 3, greater or equal to lambda 4, and then, there, and then the negatives. Whenever um, your whole cohomology splits over the whole family into pieces, you can have um, 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 the Lyapunov exponents also um, arise from those splitting pieces. So you have one Lyapunov exponent that stems from here, and let me call that Lyapunov exponent lambda a. So the lambda a is one of those, but I don't know which. I don't know if it's, well, it's certainly not the biggest one, because the biggest one comes from the canonical system, so lambda 1 is, is the one that sits in here, but I don't know um, if lambda a is lambda 2, lambda 3, or lambda 4. Um, by construction, I mean that's uh, ask Alex. So that's that, that sort of um, built into the construction. Here you see it right away because um, yes. because it's uh, from a morphism. But for the B part, you have to to think, and that's that's exactly where um, why that construction is nearly unique or unique with a few friends. Same argument here. I have a Lyapunov exponent lambda b that stems from here, and I don't know which one it is. And this is a rank four. The prim variety is a two-dimensional B variety. This is a rank four system. Here's the second guy, which I want to call lambda prim. And again, so the whole set is lambda one, lambda a, lambda b, lambda prim, matched to them in an order I don't quite know. And they are all rational in that uh, particular case. Because these are rational, because they stand from subsystems. This one is rational, and the sum is rational, so um, the last one also has to be rational. Um, there's one relation, because if you have, oops, yeah, no, it's okay. Um, if you have a, a double covering and the differential up there comes from a quadratic differential downstairs, the S. K. Kozevich Zorich um, analysis of Siegel Beach constant gives you a relation between the invariant Lyapunov exponents, um, the, the, which is the one that is stuck from down here, and the um, anti-invariant up here, um, up to uh, um, the obvious constant, or well, uh, computable constant, the name of that one. That one is just related to the, the zeros um, of the quadratic fraction. So you have one relation between the Lyapunov exponents. Okay. And the, the main theorem I was telling you, we have the rate, the, it's had set, um, it's cut out by a Hilbert modular form of weight 1, 3. And this means that the, the, the ratio between these two Lyapunov exponents is 3 to 1. So this one is smaller, this, one, this means that this one is a third. You might compare um, at that stage uh, to genus 2, where um, there was a Hilbert modular form that was cutting out um, the loci um, first um, uh, found by map. And this is a Hilbert modular form of weight, um, weight 3, 9. And this meant that the second Lyapunov exponent is a third. And in the two prim loci, there are two Hilbert modular forms that I have written a paper myself about, but I don't know the weights by heart anymore. 
1,5 and 7, 1,5 and 2,14, uh, resulting in the second Japon of exponent, the fifth, and the second Japon of exponent, the seventh. And one of them is the primitive genus 3, and one of them is the primitive genus 4. Just to tell you how the mechanism of Hilbert modular forms translates into knowledge about dynamics, um, in, um, into some information about the set. The yeah, of exponents for these, um, for these curves are not totally easy to compute, but what you can do is, in that Gothic locus, there are the neglected um, square discriminants, and the square discriminants correspond to origami, square tile surfaces. And for the square tile surfaces, you can take um, a SAGE program. I think I have to thank um, Vincent for having uh, assembled that SAGE program. You just open it, you code um, a cathedral, uh, an origami cathedral, and you let it at least approximately compute the individual Lyapunov exponents. And what you get oops, is that table. Okay, you do it for d equals 28, for 32, and this, in some cases, like 60, the, the sum of Lyapunov exponents can be computed exactly. That's why you see here an exact uh, rational number rather than approximation of which only three digits are correct. You stare at the, those, um, those examples, and you see a bunch of numbers. Okay. Now keep in mind that there is a theorem by Eskin Bonatti Wilkinson that tells us that when you have a sequence of Teichmuller curves converging, um, well, equidistant, well, any se that sequence of um, Teichmuller curves equidistributes in the stratum, and in that situation, the individual Lyapunov exponents converge, converge to something. So if, they, if these numbers converge, they have to converge something. And if for whole, my whole family of um, Gothic type Muller curves, I claim to you a few slides back that the, the, the prim Lyapunov of exponent is always a third. Which do you, whom do you think? Lambda 2, lambda 3, or lambda 4? Who is going to converge to a third? Not. I agree with you. Um, <laughs> Um, this requires a backup. <laughs> so this requires a backup that makes the whole thing um, um, oh, erase the second sentence. I, that's not, this sentence is not there. You don't see this sentence. This, this sentence is not there. Um, um, <laughs> so the, what is the, the um, the corrected version of the theorem is that the Hilbert modular surface, um, the Hilbert modular form GD, the Gothic modular form, cuts out the Teichmuller curve, but it unfortunately cuts out also spurious components. And um, the fortunate thing is um, that these spurious components are somehow under control. Um, we're not, we don't fully understand the picture yet, but these uh, spurious components are a union of Shimura curves. Um, there's a Bosagia cycle, same name for the uh, two different names for the same objects. And for them, um, the second Lyapunov exponent is known. The ratio of the intersection numbers between the two foliation classes is known. So once we have completely figured out which uh, Shimura curves, um, I mean, for, for a given D are being um, spuriously contained in the vanishing locus of the Gothic modular form, um, we will be able to remove that contribution from the Euler characteristic, and we'll also be able to compute exactly um, the Lyapunov exponents. And for those where we already have numerical data, things fortunately match with that table. So um, the containment is um, that containment is not strict for d equals 12, as we have seen with a Gothic duck example. And um, I would guess it's probably strict with very few exceptions like d equals 12, 40, and probably one or two more. Um, it can't be, uh, the containment has to be strict. Yeah. I know that the containment is strict um, for all but five and remaining d, and as, again, as a consequence of the upper yeah, Okay, so that's, that's the overall picture. Um, so let me, um, pass to an explanation of how we want to, how we're actually proving that and 
how um, the, um, so what's, the, what's the corrected one third? I don't know the full formula. You, you take the volume weighted average of the vo um, the Lyapunov exponent of the Tidemore curves plus one for the volume times the volume of the Shimura curve, um, and that gives a third. So, it so it's below a third. And it depends on the Tidemore curve. Now. It depends on the Tidemore curve. It depends on d. And so in order to give you the closed formula, I have to fully figure out the volumes of the Shimura curves. And we have a list of those till discriminant 100, but we don't have the closed full formula. Uh, Mark, in principle, uh, do you know if uh, the Hunt uh, is in this locus or not? For sure. Because this would mean that for d equals 144, uh, it would be your lambda prime would be zero, right? I, a Shimura, a Shimura I don't expect it. I, I don't know it. I don't know it, but just the, the, if you graph the things, it's pretty smooth. Mm -hmm. And having a, a 144 with zero there would somehow not not fit very much very well into the graph. But I I don't know it. Look at look at the look at those data. Mm -hmm. I mean, things. It's not constant, but you can you can already with those few values here a clear asymptotics. Imagine you had for 144, 100 zero, zero, um, hanging out there. No. <laughs> not, not very plausible, but I haven't checked specifically that question. So, do you know the asymptotics? Can you figure out the amount of transparency? Yeah, uh, a few, one, one week and we're there. I mean, you just have to uh, do, all, do the prim things and then restrict to prime discriminants where the formula probably will be easy, and then you take on that subsequence, you, you compute what's going to happen. Um, the sum of Lyapunov is, is something like 1.91 for the sum of Lyapunov exponents. That's, uh, but that's numerical data for the moment. I, have, I don't, can't prove close point. Okay, what's happening? What's happening in that picture? So um, suppose this is a Gothic beach surface. Oops. Yeah, maybe that's better. So this is a Gothic beach surface. As any, um, um, as any genus 4 curve, it has a Jacobian of x, um, which is um, which is a, a abelian fourfold. So this is a fourfold, um, and now in that fourfold we have the the a and b, the elliptic curves, or more precisely, the pullbacks of these uh, elliptic curves sit in there. They are abelian subvarieties. And you can take um, the quotient, um, and I'm being a bit rough here, and call that the prim, which is, which is the twofold. There's the prim, and the, um, there's the dual of the prim. They are not the same. And just for exp uh, rough explanation here, I'm glossing over that detail. So the prim is roughly the quotient of that fourfold by that, not that twofold. So um, you can consider the image of that curve on the composition map in that prim. And this map is called the Abel prim map. Um, it's so, sort of a friend of the usual Abel Jacobi map that embeds the curve into its Jacobian. So we have a curve um, inside the prim variety. So it's again a co-dimension one situation. But let me uh, put as a tiny little aside that you should not confuse with the other co-dimension one situation, which was the um, um, Hilbert modular surface. And here um, we had the Gothic Teichmoor curve, and this, this was embedded as the locus where GD is zero. Well, now you know that GD equals zero has some other components. But this is also a co-dimension one situation. But um, um, Please separate the, the two things. Now we're looking fiberwise, reach surface by reach surface. Ends. Curve, surface, co-dimension one. Who cuts that thing out? Um, so how do you um, how do you write down on an abelian variety? Is such an abelian variety in the prim uh, variety as any um, abelian variety of dimension two? 
um, is the complex plane modulo a certain lattice that comes with a 1, 6 polarization. How do you write down um, the image of, um, um, of a curve in an abelian variety? How do you write down a divisor in there? Well, then the name of the game is you write down a theta function. A theta function is a function on C2 with a certain invariance property. Those who have seen it, uh, they know those um, who don't won't learn from giving me the transformation property. It has the, the transformation property is made such that that the vanishing closure of that theta function um, um, is well, a well-defined thing on that closure, meaning on that pre um, so we want to we want to give a correct theta function that cuts out uh, the prim variety. And um, <clears throat> in order to see what uh, what's happening uh, here, what's the image of that uh, prim, um, what's the theta function that we should cook? We should analyze first what is that map. Now I was a little bit sloppy. Um, that map depends on a choice of a point. So where shall I put a point little x? In here, where shall I map it to? Usually, you have to choose a point um, on your surface x um, that is the base point of this map. So you map it to x minus p1, and p1 is now one of the um, marked points on the Gothic globus. Remember, here we had the p i's and the z i's. The zeros were the zero, oh, the z i's were the zeros of the form, and the p i's were the friends. So you map it. Um, into the Jacobian by one of the PIs. Which one doesn't matter, as you'll see in a moment, as long as it's one of, as it's one of the PIs. When you analyze the situation a little bit, um, you'll find out that the image here is anything but arbitrary. It looks pretty much precisely like that. Yes? So the PIs are the critical points, or the fixed points for the involution? They are the fixed po uh, uh, these are fixed points from for, for the involution. These are the zeros. zeros. And these are the fixed, but not zeros. Um, OK. Among all the, the special points on an abelian variety, the, on a abelian surface, there are the two torsion points, the, the half, um, half lattice points. And um, so what is that picture um, supposed to tell you? It's supposed to tell you that, first of all, that the image of x, that picture, is a cartoon graph, a one-dimensional graph for um, lack of space um, or dimensions on the blackboard of that image. So that image here is supposed to look like a take, take the picture from the, the slide, which is much better. That, that image of that curve is the thing over there. So it passes through exactly four um, two torsion points, the black dots. It tells you also that you pass three times um, through the origin, that point is the origin. So it, uh, more precisely, um, the points P1, P2, and P3 go to the origin. And moreover, Z1, Z2, and Z3 go to three different um, um, non-zero non two-torsion points. So those points, I should have uh, written a name. This, this is maybe the image of Z1, Z2, Z3. And you, if you look carefully at that picture, um, at these points, the curve has a horizontal tangent. Horizontal tangent means that if you're on that abelian variety, you take um, the differential form D, well, the coordinates, let's put them U1 and U2. If you take DU1, horizontal tangent means um, that du1 has a double zero on these points. So that's a summary of what you get from analyzing the situation. If you're on the Gothic, then, then the image of Abel Prim looks like that. Last step is sort of to come back. Come back and describe the Gothic locus. You have to cook up what happens at the Gothic locus. So you have to construct um, theta functions that do exactly that thing. Now Alex um, always tells uh, me that um, SL2R invariant loci and tight curves 
arise um, due to a miracle in dimensions. And this, um, he and the, the, the three authors of that paper have their version of um, explaining the miracle of dimensions. And I have sort of the miracle um, of um, explaining, of counting dimensions. Let me tell you. So how many th uh, theta functions are there? Remember, that thing is one six polarized. And um, so this roughly means that we have six th theta functions, the six dimensional space of theta functions appear. But we want the thing to be um, in, um, compatible with the involution j, which means that we want odd theta functions. So we have a four dimensional space, space of odd, odd theta functions. Four dimensional space is, you, you mean, you can pick your favorite linear combination of these, of the basis elements, and find the theta function that is supposed to cut out that thing over there. Four dimensional space means, I mean, multiplying the theta function by five, just by a constant, doesn't change anything. So you have three wishes. That's what that means. You have three wishes to fulfill all that stuff. Okay. This is an odd theta function, so it automatically goes through those points. So you want it to be go to triply through that point. Triply through that point means that the horizontal and the vertical derivative at that point are zero. Um, so the first wish is that the horizontal derivative at, um, of the theta function at zero vanishes, and the vertical derivative, uh, sorry, the vertical and the horizontal derivative at zero vanish. Two wishes go. The, the triply vanishing here then, then follows from off. Let's do that on the right. Then you want um, that the horizontal derivative of the theta function at the point mu is zero. Third wish gone. But we only had three wishes. So that's best we can do for a generic point of the Hilbert modular surface. For a generic point of the Hilbert modular surface, we have a four-dimensional space, three wishes, and we can arrange that uh, our the vanishing locus of our theta function goes triply through that point and um, has a horizontal tangent like that. Meaning for generic, um, oops, um, for a generic point, we can make the theta function look like that. So but we, have, we still have two more conditions to, to be satisfied. We need the thing to be um, um, horizontal here and hor um, have a horizontal tangent here. So of course we can now say um, that we want the, um, um, the um, derivative of the theta function to be zero at the point lambda. But the question is, what, is, what happens uh, with the uh, derivative at the point lambda plus mu, that point over there. So roughly we have five conditions in order to be satisfied, in order to cut out the prim image. The first three are um, given by an appropriate, uh, correspond to choosing uniquely and appropriately the thing in that, um, in that space. The fourth condition, well that's the condition you could impose by saying, okay, I have a code I mentioned one condition, on my Hilbert module surface, let's impose that condition. And uh, then I can, um, then if I'm on that code I mentioned one subvariety, then that condition holds. And there's a miracle due to um, properties of theta functions and their behavior at two torsion points that if you get closer, closer to the Gothic locus, it looks like that. And if you get even closer, and if you're there, the one tangent implies the other tangent. So that condition in the presence of the other ones already implies that condition. So that condition automatically checks and um, makes the dimension miracle on the Gothic locus. And uh, I think that's what I have to say. Thank you.
I have a, I have a guess uh, how they generally look like, but that's not totally sound. So, I guess I'm with your tape, so let's not yet. Uh, <laughs> you'll see very soon. Or should we just turn off the video tape? <laughs> <laughs> if you turn it off, I...